So the first thing I'd like to say is, um, for me, this is an honor to be able to bring us together because we are the storytellers for the culture. We are the voices and the hearts and the minds and the brilliance behind a lot of what drives conversation online, although we often don't get the credit. Um, some of you may have saw the interview that I did with Ye this year uh, at the top of the year, which wasn't a planned interview. It was something that organically came out of two people coming together for an idea about a conversation that was missing. And so when we were talking about Black History Month, he had an idea that we should stop calling it Black History Month because as black people, we should be focused on the future because we are the future. And it was such a powerful moment because all of us as journalists or media owners, regardless of where we sit, heads of network, heads of uh, your own companies are working within the confines of companies that we don't own. We know that we're the hot sauce that's often put on the shelf far behind all the other condiments. And you know what I'm talking about. Um, Ye's vision for creating a space to allow us to be honored and honor each other and also have a connection to somebody who drives culture in music, fashion, and all things culture. So I thought it was great that we could uh, bring this idea of Black Future, Black Future Month to a conversation. And he said, well, why don't we invite people that look like us in media? And when I think about who we are, we're not black people or black media. We are black people in media. Because you know, as you know, in the conversation of what media is, there's mainstream and black or mainstream and urban, but we're the people that get every, everybody talking. So without further ado, I just wanted to welcome everybody just to kind of do some housekeeping. Um, this is also the first time that Ye has invited the media into Sunday service. So I would just like to give a round of applause for that. And, and um, I'm gonna hand it over because he's the man of the hour. But again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and I'm just proud to be here and share the space with all of you. So here's Ye. You know, as a Christian, you know, you said you're not supposed to talk to healers or psychics, but I did talk to a healer because, you know, during the separation, I just talked to anybody I could that could explain to me what all was going on. And this one healer told me, I'm not, I only spoke to one, said that I have been dealing with uh, the uh, anger and frustration from betrayal of multiple lifetimes, and that all I was put here to do is to build community. So my cousin would remind me that when I was five years old, I would be designing cities at age five. So you'll put, you'll see like little clips of things coming out or see what we did uh, aesthetically with homes and the language that we did with clothes or, you know, this idea like Balenciaga and lean into that. It's not because it's a, a name brand. It's like I actually hired the head of Balenciaga for Yeezy season one. And I thought that he was from the same planet as me, the type of ideas that I have a, I have a future agenda. I'll just be really straightforward about that. Like, I'm gonna state what my agenda is. I have a family agenda, I have a community agenda, I have a, a future agenda. And uh, some of you guys saw the Drink Champs interview and I talked about being a leader. And, a, and then what people would say, well, you don't say that you're a leader because you come under attack. And I think that's a trait of a leader, being willing to step out in front of an idea, no matter how much it can hurt you or who would put them under attack for it. As you guys see me talking right now, I, I feel that I don't look erratic and ramped up. But if you read my Instagram on your way over here, people are quick to write it off, quick to just say it's crazy. So. You know, they, my boy Antonio Brown, they tried to pay him $200,000 to submit himself so they could put that narrative on him. It's a way of being publicly locked up in a prison. So I would think, I say, you know what? I'm, I'm like Larry Hoover, or I'm like Mandela. I'm actually walking around in a prison of a concept of a narrative that people put on me to get you guys to not pay attention. Uh, and they pluck us out and give us these little homes right next to each other. And we barely could afford to actually have our cousins stay next to us. We, we don't have someone that's there for us when we're having a hard time because we want to just have these cars and be inside of this gated community and we're separated from our families. We don't have our support system with us. They say, you're the superstar, boom. We're going to put you at Louis Vuitton. 
Virgil was the third person in a position of power at LVMH to die of cancer without his gang, without his support system, without his Dame Dash. Let's, let's keep him out of there. Let's keep, yeah, I didn't do one collaboration. I was just there for the hug and the cosign. And it frustrated me also because we fought for that together. We went to Fendi and intern together. We went to Japan with Nigo together. We created, you know, the pastel office and we were doing photoshops and we barely could figure out how to even make a hoodie together. And then it was time to separate. I think about, you know, you talk about fathers being removed out of the homes throughout the 80s. Uh, and that same technique is now, like we as a people are like the walking Tuskegee experiment. That experiment has worked on weakening families, weakening the strength of family, and weakening God inside the family, and giving it to robots, fear, numbers. You know, when I go back to this thing where I said, this healer said, and I know this is not Christian, I know it's Sunday service this morning, uh, this healer said for multiple lifetimes, I, I dealt with this idea of like betrayal. But the healer also said, there's nothing that's gonna stop you this time from building these communities. You know, not since Black Wall Street has there been a fully A to Z black owned community where we can not only just control the media and our narrative, but we control our water, we control our farms, we control our schools. On a, on a flight to Chicago yesterday, and you know, I was upset that I didn't have Chicago with me going to Chicago. Drake hit me and said, give me the link for the game. I wanna see, I wanna see Rob ball out. And for us to create this union, you know, where he's starting, where we're starting a league, a league of our own. When I'm crazy, it's okay. Now, today's like today, where we're really organizing, now I'm at risk when we really can be organized. Larry Hoover brought me and Drake together. That man created peace. He called that from the prison. Larry Hoover called that from the prison. And everybody was happy. <laughs> you know, when people see me and Drake pull up to a basketball game with both of our, our sons, with my oldest and his son, that's gonna save people's lives in the hood. They're gonna see that. I'm gonna show y'all a video in about a couple of minutes, and on it, I speak a bit of my story, like my main motivation, why I bought the house next door, is to be next to my kids. My dad told me three weeks ago, this is the first time he said this, he said, your mother said, I'm moving to Chicago, and if you try to come find me, you'll never see him again. My dad never said that to about three weeks ago. Why did he say that? Because I was begging him to call Kim and he was refusing to do it. He said, I don't wanna talk. I said, dad, I need your help. I can't see my kids, I can't do this. And it's not like a simple you can't see your kids. No, it's like reaching your hand through your, the blender. You pull, you pull in disrespect, you know what I'm saying? Leaders in the hood have been put in positions like whether someone's like a, a boss of anything, they lock that leader up and by the time they get out, they've lost their ability to lead. They've lost their leadership. By the time the dad gets into the house, he might be drinking. He might, he's not the 100% version of what he could be. So when I see my daughter with wearing lipstick against my will on TikTok, and if I say something I'm considered to be erratic, I'm like, my dad didn't have a voice and my dad didn't have the money to stand up. And also he felt like he needed to stay in Atlanta for his career. People are saying, you better not wear that hat for your career. I gotta point this out to y'all. That's the main thing that put me in a hospital. Because every manager and every place I turn, they said, your life gonna be over if you got a difference of an opinion. My mom fought, my dad fought, he, my dad was a Black Panther. My mom was, worked for Jesse Jackson at Operation Push, was the first black female head of the English Department at Chicago State University, which we're looking to go and buy that school right now. Um, and she fought for uh, a fountain, what fountain we could drink out of. If we think we barely can vote, and this is one thing I say in the video, then 
we, we, we're not gonna have a choice on what to do. This is our first time with any position and any voice. By the time that I saw that 6.6 .6 hit, I said, I like, let me look this up. Now, I'm gonna tell y'all, there is a person in Africa that's at seven point something, right? <laughs> but I'm gonna just tell you something. I placed that headline because the Forbes kept fucking with me. They kept bullying me. They kept controlling my narrative. And every time it was like, Kanye's a billionaire, he really wants you to know. Because they only want people to look successful that followed all the rules. From high school, to media, to basketball. They want to make your leaders be the ones that are being led. Nobody leading me but God. We're born into this society, this culture. God placed us here in um, a broken world, but it gives us an opportunity, it gives us purpose. We want to change things. We've all been set with this programming of heal the world, fix the world, save the world. What are the things you could do? If you could just write down one thing, you say, I could be a fireman, I could be a lawyer, I could be a rapper, I could be a basketball player, I could be a doctor, I could save the world. But it's that I that's the problem. So let's turn down the three lights right now and let's show them the, show them the video. Everybody, my name is Jay. My mom and dad met in Atlanta. That's where I was born. My father was a Black Panther. My mother worked at Operation Push with Jesse Jackson and became the first female head of the English department at Chicago State University. After my mom and dad separated, they offered my mother a job in a different state than my dad. And that changed the dynamic of me and my father's relationship to this day. The system has been separating families in every way that they can for years. America is made to enslave us. What they ever gave us, we didn't prove we done showed, it's documented. Now it's cemented. Black future, it's time to invent it. If Ye said it, you know that he meant it. There's no more Black History Month. Every February, reminding us that we just barely can vote. You shouldn't have to be a tech genius, a basketball god, a musical wizard to be able to hold down your family. Been about four or five days since I see my kids. But we in America, ain't we? That's just how it is. When they write the history, when they write the narrative, when they take something that's strong and make it look like it's an embarrassment, when they take something that's weak and try to even make a comparison, when you say something that's strong and they say that you arrogant. And that's why the media be at our head. I want them to hear clearly exactly what I said. I want them to hear clearly exactly what God said. I believe he uses me as a vessel you know what they say about Ye, he ain't crazy, he's special. I'm not a perfectionist, I'm a betterment, and betterist, and it's time for improvement. We start by declaring Black Future Month. We're thinking about the future and not the past. This is a calling, this is more than balling. This is more than the dreams of a hard court in a Spalding. This is more than the dreams of the White House. This is our house. This is our country to be bought. But nah, nah, that's not what we was taught. I remember my daughter came home and she said, Dad, I found out in school today I was black. Wait, how, how, who, who told you that? Oh, I found out because it's Black History Month. I learned about Martin Luther King and I learned that I was black. She learned that she was black from Sierra Canyon's perspective. And what do you think Sierra Canyon's perspective of black is? 
You think it's talk about Mansa Musa, or you think it's talk about Christopher Columbus? So if we want to talk about black history, who wrote that history for us? They beat down ideas that will keep you enslaved mentally. They target you, they put you in that box to control your mind and to make you fearful. I just don't have no fear left in me. So all I got is love. I've been waiting for us to take the power in our own hand. I've been waiting for us to control our narrative. We need to empower local leaders. And that's our focus in America, in a capitalist society, for us to unify. Our money is being made and going back into a white system everywhere. Our 44 million is worth 1.8 trillion. That means the black dollar is neck and neck with the biggest company in the world, which is Apple. And more focus, the black dollar will be the biggest company in the world. Yeezy is the only 100% black owned brand that is cultural. And what me and Virgil broke down is the black belief in black design. Because we used to hold luxury here and black design there. And I'm fine, I'm fine to take what they gotta say because it's not about me. It's about us, it's about our children, it's about an example of what we can be when we decide to walk off the field and take our narrative into our own hands. Black Future Month. This is the future. We would like any of you guys that are interested to record your own versions of this, this expression that we take this month to highlight people who are pushing where we're going in the future and who we are today, the new superheroes that we have today. And Prophet is one of those new superheroes that's gonna change our narrative and show a direction of what we can be other than uh, only in the sports and entertainment. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Prophet Walker. I grew up right here in Los Angeles. And to Ye's point of rewriting our own narrative, um, much like many of us in, in the US, frankly, that have grown up in poverty in, in different systems, I too dealt with that. I grew up in South LA and Watts. Unfortunately, my mother was addicted to heroin and abandoned my sister and I in the housing projects in Nickerson Gardens. And from there, I was actually raised by my dad, my grandfather, and a host of uncles. Really, my dad instilled in me that I had to have my own backbone. Unfortunately, at 16, I was incarcerated. I was sentenced to six years in the California State Prison. And I served about five and a half of those years. When I sat in the courtroom, I watched people look at me and call me a monster irredeemable. There's five criteria that we used to try children as an adult under. One of them was the sophistication of the crime, the gravity of the crime, what the crime was, and the, one of the fifth was the most striking to me, which was whether or not the court believed this minor, this kid, could be rehabilitated. And when I was 16, I, it struck me. I was like, these people are looking at me, questioning whether or not, from their lens, could I be rehabilitated. And that was the narrative that was beat into me. And I remember many days being like, should I kill myself? Should I not? I was 16. I had a baby on the way. And somewhere along the way, I decided I would control my own narrative. Completely. And while I was incarcerated, I started a college program with 30 people. Today it serves tens of thousands of people. Started one of the California's largest justice reform organizations, the ARC, that since got rid of the law that tries children as an adult and a host of other laws that's changed. Much of, again, the angle that was left for me it seemed bleak, right? Either I knew I wasn't gay or brawn. In my mind, I could 
probably beat them in basketball. In truth, no. I wanted to play basketball. And so what was real for me was I could be an engineer. I could use my mind. I was, forget, redeemable. I was a baby under unthinkable circumstances and made choices. And while I sat in prison, what I looked around was a ton of our fathers locked in cages, never coming home. Luckily, they got to pour in me, into me too. And they shared their dreams with me. And I honored that and said, I'll, I'll move it forward. Today, I run one of the largest uh, real estate companies that's focused on communal, communal housing. I literally, what Ye describes that he drew as a kid, we had never been connected, never knew one another, started this company six years ago. I literally build large scale communities in Los Angeles because I feel like for so long, even the housing that we have, how many of you all stay in luxury apartments and don't know your neighbors? To Ye's point, I never heard Ye say this. Your cousin isn't next to you when you have a heartbreak, when you lose your family, when you lose your job, when you go through the realities of life as you try and get up and get out of the hood is what we were told. Not to invest back in our hood as they see it as up and coming and they invest in it. And we don't get to invest in it because it's too late. We're told to get up and get out. And with that, this is why Black Future Month is actually important. Owning our own narrative, telling stories that are beyond just clickbait stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm honored to be here, honored to be a side yay. And uh, thank you guys for your time. So there's a lot of amazing and powerful people here. And uh, this is Michelle Mitchell from Meta. And she and I were talking about her program, We The Culture, and how important it is for us to continue to invest in telling our stories. And so uh, we'll kind of bounce some, um, some ideas off of you. And three topics that we wanted to talk about um, were the desegregation of media, um, black media versus being black in media, right? Um, a lot of people, I see Emerald over here who broke the internet with Halle Berry when uh, she made that white publicist stop, or Halle made her white publicist stop and not allowing her to ask her question. And a lot of us have had those experiences. Also, empowering the powerful. After the interview with Ye, he sent me a text when I, t I, I thanked him for the opportunity. I said, you know, it was really powerful because a lot of people of your level don't always reach back. We all know that, we, all right? They use us to get hot and then they out of there. So when he texted me back, he said, power is empowering the powerful. I was like, wait a minute, I had to really die. He said, he, he, he said you didn't respond to that text for a while. I said, I had to digest it. Because it's oftentimes we're not reminded how powerful we are. And so to be reminded of that moment was, it was something to take in. And also something we talked about in the interview was canceling cancel culture. Because cancel culture really only exists in our community. Look at Joe Rogan and Whoopi Goldberg. We don't even have to have that conversation, do we? Well, maybe we should. And uh, I got a call and was told to be careful of what I say in support of Whoopi. Nobody called me and said anything about what I said about Joe. Uh, so I just thought, I, I really try to look at everything with different optics. I'm in it, but I'm also outside of it. And I think him allowing us, yeah, allowing us the opportunity to bring one conversation to the table, um, I think is really powerful. But before we get into that, I want to welcome Jason White, who is the choir director for Sunday service, to lead us in prayer, and then they're going to serve food while we get into that conversation. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So glad and so honored to be here uh, with you on today. Uh, I'm so glad that we stand on the shoulders of, of some great leaders that have gone before us. Black History Month used to be called Negro History Week. It used to be just a week. It started in 1926, uh, and uh, it became a part of February um, because of some leaders you know, that, that made it a part of uh, of that time, Martin Luther King, different ones, Abraham Lincoln. I'm so glad that our history is in great hands today. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about our future. Our future is in the great hands of great leaders like Mr. Prophet, like, of course, 
Yay. The wealthiest black man to date. Our future is bright. We're going to take over our communities. We're going to change the narrative as to what has been said on today, that nothing is impossible. By faith, we are who we are in God. I've never really been a fan of, um, of really we shall overcome because I'm an overcomer already. I'm an overcomer in what God has said that I am. He said that in him, we are overcomers. And so for me to want to overcome, no, I am an overcomer. So I have already overcome. And I'm praying that, that we would tell that narrative that we are overcomers. We don't have time to overcome. We have already overcame, and we want to let the world know that we are here as overcomers. I am Black Future. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, O oh God, that you have called us to be great. You have called us to be mighty. You've called us to be strong. I pray, O oh God, that you would give us the strength and the knowledge and the understanding to go throughout all of the nations, to go through all out throughout the earth, and that we would bring change, that you would give us the ingenuity and the power and the might to bring change upon the young, that we would bring change within real estate, that we would bring change within our, our minds and our bodies, that we could tell this community that God saves, he heals, and most of all, he rules. Bless this time. Bless this time of talking. Bless this time of, of sharing. Oh God, let us be on one accord on together. Let there be love among us. Let there be a love of change that cannot never be broken. Be with us. Touch us. Let your wisdom and your guidance, oh God, fill this room on today. We thank you for Mr. West. We thank you for Ye. We thank you for all of the leaders that are here. Let there be change. Let there be something mighty and power that would rise up among us. Bless the food that is coming, oh God. Let it perform no harm or no danger. And we give you glory in all that we do and say on today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Jason. We the Culture is a reappropriation. It's giving credit where credit is due. And to each of you, I say thank you for elevating the culture. Thank you for shifting the culture. Um, each of you, you know, there's a song that, that is um, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, right? Each of you are lighthouses and you're shining so brightly for our community to see and we need you. The first question that I'd like to bring to the table to discuss is, you know, what is the differentiator? Like when we have the mic, what's different about the conversation? What can we bring to the stories that we're telling and how does that shift culture as we look into our black future? Right, right, oh, right over here. I'm Tanisha Laverne Grant with BlackInAmerica.com as well as Pix11 News New York. I think what we can, what not think, I know that whenever the mic is in our hand, we have a responsibility to our ancestors and we have a responsibility to anyone who was looking to our content for fact, right? It is up to us when someone comes to our mic to ask them questions that are going to move the culture forward. I'm a red carpet correspondent, it's how I eat, it's how I've made my legacy in the space. And when I'm on a red carpet, it's important for me not to ask so much what somebody is wearing, but really about the work, right? That's why they're there. When someone comes to the red carpet, it's the culmination of everything that they've accomplished in that moment. And I think as media correspondents, red carpet correspondents, entertainment journalists, multimedia specialists, Whenever the mic is in your hand, it's so important to stay on message. And the message is you are serving as a buttress for the talent, the writer, the actor, the producer who is in front of your mic. You have to ask them about their work. That is what is moving the culture. Asking them what they're wearing is moving mainstream. It's moving their agenda. But when we ask, What's it like for you to be in this moment? 
that's moving the culture. And I think we need more of that. These spaces are, they're not easy to access, you know, and so we have to really do diligence by it. I like thank what you. you said about, no, thank you. I like what you said about, um, really what you're talking about is responsibility. When you have the microphone in your hand, you have a responsibility to see and to see people accurately in their full shades and, and not just, you know, what is mainstream. So I'd love to hear from someone about, right over here, um, about what that responsibility is for you and how you're shifting the culture forward. Hi everyone, my name is Charisma D. Berry and I'm with Essence. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Similarly to Ye, I was raised by a Black Panther, so I might have a little bit more impassioned speech um, than is acceptable sometimes, but I'm gonna try to keep it cute. Um, I think, yeah, I think that one of the things, I mean, Essence is the largest 100% Black-owned media company at scale in the world. So we kind of see it all, particularly with black celebrity. But what we often encounter is that we as black people think that white ice is colder, meaning that when Vogue comes to you for something, you are happy and, and we are, they are able to engage in a level of celebrity that when we try to engage with celebrity, we, we might get something, but we're not going to get the same level of access, right? We're not going to get the same level of respect and what that ends up being is that our output is different to our consumer, which then makes the consumer respect our medium different than what they would respect from people who don't look like us. So it's kind of a little bit of a cycle and we are continuously trying to push the culture forward and change that narrative that black media isn't good enough, that our journalists aren't educated and highly qualified but I think that it really starts with us breaking the cycle of believing that, you know, if you, if you perform at Stagecoach, you have made it further than if you perform at Essence Festival. Because again, Essence Festival is the largest festival in the country. But when we say that, it almost sounds ridiculous to people. So that, that's one of the biggest things, is just changing the way that we think about ourselves so that we hold black media in regard in the same way that we hold other media companies. This is the moment where we have to say, in order for us to stay free, because this ain't different, we do have a freedom. We're actually allowed to do this and say this right now. If we don't keep doing this and keep pushing each other, then there will be a moment where our voices will be taken away also. And it's the time where we're not gonna back down. We're not gonna have people say, oh, you need to stop communicating because you're gonna look ramped up. And like, tell me what y'all need. Let's tell each other what we need from each other. Let's rise up collectively. That's what I'm really like. I'm so happy you went in there. You talked about the responsibility of the type of questions that we're asking. If we're so used to like thinking about, uh, Okay, you know what, let me cut, I'm gonna cut off what I'm saying because a lot of these things you're saying, it's almost like we created a new version of a panel right here. And I just wanna emphasize like, yes, book that Essence cover today, we're gonna shoot this within the next week. Oh, what'd you say? No. When he says something, he's very intentional, so I'll, I'll connect with you and make it happen. Um, if we have the mic over, Kelvin, Connie, James, Amber, I know that we're all eating, but um, if you want to say something from a content. Hi, everybody. I'm Connie Orlando from BET, and thank you for having me. I think this is an important conversation to have, and I, yes, yes. It's, it's hard. It's hard uh, being a media company in a world where there's other media companies that people feel are more important whether it's about the money, the exposure, how do we support Essence? How do we support BT in ways that are meaningful? Like the young lady said, like it makes, when we, when we don't show up, it makes us seem like our brand isn't as important. And it's not something that to aspire to. Like we're great in the beginning, and then when it gets hot, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll move on from that. But it's also this notion of, and at BT, we just try to really have authentic conversations. I think that's our, our superpower. Like when we talk about something, we talk about it no filter. We talk about it like it's just us in the room. And that's a strength. And we're always open to partnership. Like I love this Black Future Month and we should talk about that. Um, 
and really like I think power is in mapping out a year. Like let's let's get together the end of a year and look at the next year and map the whole year out. So that then we can say, okay, February is Black Future Month and we need to do this and be strategic. Like we, we tend not to be strategic and we tend not to partner with each other to, for, to make it stronger. And I think that's so important. I think it's something that we all need to do. This notion of support is so important. And in terms of content, like, you know, it's a blessing to be at BET because I, I want to present our images the way they should be presented. Like we did Black Girls Rock because the media tears down black women. And just to show that show that was so aspirational and inspirational, like those are the type of things we wanna do, but we also wanna have real conversations. People who know me know I'm always open for a conversation and to figure something out where we can partner and, and uh, move forward. And then the second point, I hope we talk about it later, is this point of ownership. Like we gotta really start owning, like it's great that you own your content. We need to own studios, we need to own things because that's one where the equity is and that's where the legacy is. And if we all, we are so powerful, if we all come together for something and get behind it. Like we are so, we don't, it's, it's off the meter how powerful we can be if we get behind something, whether it's a studio, whether it's a network, whether it's a magazine, whatever it is, if we come together, it will succeed because we are powerful. Our, 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 our culture, our trends, everything. Like we lead it all and if we just kind of really invested in ourselves and, and supported each other. No, no I, I love that. And it's, I love that. And one thing in talking to you about Black Future Month, when he posted that, he, he said, let's make this a movement and not a moment. What I also love is that Ye is asking all the brands he touches to financially get behind Black Future Month too. And so he's putting me on with Adidas. He's putting me in with different Gap, who's saying, how are we investing in Black Future Month and what does that look like? Right, and that's the strategy of it, right? Like it yes. starts here, but what are we gonna do in June? Like let's map out that whole thing and figure out actionable things that we can get people to do. Because yes. nine times out of 10, when we do a news thing, it's not just about reporting the news or checking the box that you did something. What can I, we use this platform to to engage folks to do something that they may not otherwise know or to resources that they don't know about? How do we empower and push for, forward? Absolutely. I don't know the resources, I'll tell you that. You know, it's one thing to have money, it's another thing to have power. The power is in the community. You know, right now it's offered $100 million to bring Donda Media to Apple. And I'm saying, why can't we start our own? We got our own hardware. One of my favorite quotes. I thought about our 44 million is worth 1.8 trillion. That makes us the second biggest company in the world that we neck and neck with Apple. Our 44 million is worth 1.8 trillion. And if you think about when they had uh, gentrification, we stopped spending money on ourselves. When we were talking about Essence, that was the, the breakthrough. I did mention that me and Virgil made us believe in black design. Now we need to believe in black media. Black media needs to be just as big, if not bigger, if we're being used as culture in the media constantly, then the media company, the companies need to be as big. And it just me is just uh, angel investors, people who I invest in companies, I invest in people. I put my money where my mouth is and I'm looking to figure out how, I was looking at splash media, looking to buy splash media, you know, things like that, looking to invest in, multiple companies with a voice, just like how Bezos bought the Washington Post. But it's not just for, you know, my voice as a leader, but for our voices to empower the future leaders and not have to talk a certain way. Even right now, we're not talking in our native tongue. There's nothing more white than English itself. <laughs> But it's something that feels so powerful and so calm about us just being together and us being uh, connected. And you know, Muggs is right. You're like, see, mm -hmm, as soon as they don't want you, now you want to come back to the bubble. bubble. <laughs> so, so really quick, Amber uh, Raspberry, she hates when I tell this story, but when she used to work for um, Tyler Perry, she found the movie Precious, and I really feel like it changed his whole brand. And she wasn't one that was out there saying, look, I did this, I did this, I did, or for Color Girls. But I always make sure people know when she's in the room that she was responsible for, for those projects because they were such a turning point, not just for his career, but also for stories that needed to be told. 
So I'm glad that she was able to make it. So Amber, do you have a mic? Thank you, yes, you always embarrass me with that story. Um, hi, Amber Raspberry with Amazon Studios. And definitely like Connie, the collaboration. I'm obsessed right now with uh, looking at the diaspora in film and how Hollywood, black Hollywood can communicate with black Brazil, with the continent and looking at stories that are, that really celebrate black joy. I think we have, uh, there are very important stories of, of history, of uh, trial and triumph, but especially right now, um, I think we really need stories of black joy that are told throughout the world. And I'm looking at a lot of these packages that we call them um, for the Berlin Film Festival. Packages are films that have the actors, that have the talent, that have the director, the script is ready, and basically they say, we have this package, it's ready to go, do you wanna shoot it? And I'm seeing these packages come in uh, over the last week and talent that I know my target audience, us, would not be very excited about. And so now I am, I'm really focused and want to charge it to everybody. Let's build our own packages. Let's put together our talent, our filmmakers, our directors that white Hollywood, mainstream Hollywood may not be aware of, looking at who has next, looking at uh, an actress in Nigeria who has 20 million followers, more than, you know, any white actress that may, you know, that, that's here. How can we work with her? How can we work with that Kenyan director and create these stories that represent and redefine international film? And, you know, really looking at these these stories that are uplifting, these stories of joy, because we are seeing so many of black trauma. We live that every day. I don't need to see it on film. I wanna see, I wanna see us being normalized. I want to see Africa, uh, the, the middle class, the luxury of Africa being celebrated. The stories of, of Brazilians, Afro-Brazilians that are not told. There are ways that we can have these conversations, look across just in social media to see these filmmakers that are doing it for themselves, that just need the platform, that just need the distribution, um, you know, and, and the help of studios like Amazon, like BET, to tell their stories. So charging it to all of you, the packages, let's look for those stories, those actors that are underrepresented, may not even be known here. Let's work on ways to have those conversations to tell those stories because I'm looking. Thank you. I was with Elon at Starbase and we you know his discussions of Donda designing the Starbase community uh, where they launched the rockets. And I said, man, I just want to do deals like you, Elon. And he looked at me and said, I don't do deals, I build things. So let's stop doing deals. Let's start building things. We're too powerful. We're too connected. We got too much money. We got too much culture. We the Numenati. <laughs> this the Numenati right here. This ain't secret society. We in your face. We right here. You can see who we are. And we're going to take control of our Y'all just heard some wild ass Jay shit right there, right? <laughs> Y'all thought. <laughs> is this thing on? Oh, it is on. Hello, guys. Um, my name is Blue Tulusma. Um, I'm co-host with Jason Lee and DJ Damage on Hollywood Unlocked. And I love the conversation that I'm hearing. But one of the things that I would love everybody in this room to consider is for us to collectively rehumanize blackness. Because the media tends to create black superheroes and then turns them into black villains. And we don't know how to, how to embrace anything in between, which is most of the black community. And so I think a lot of times, black excellence then becomes a trauma response, where we have to be excellent because we can't be human. I want to see regular black people be able to have a bad day and still be shown grace. 
We're talking about black liberation, but what's the point of black liberation without black joy and black dignity? And so I think if we find a way to infuse dignity back into the way that we engage with each other, that's going to signal to everybody else that's not cool to do that, to, to cancel us anymore. So I think if we humanize everybody, it would make all of this a lot easier because it's really easy to make a villain out of someone who is not human and who's an other. Um, when Jason did that amazing interview with Ye, I wrote an article that went with it. Thank you for commissioning me for that, Jason. Said That was called, It's Time That We Humanize Kanye West. And the anger that I got from that single sentence spoke volumes. I didn't say it's time that we agree with him or deify him or absolve him of accountability. I just said, can we rehumanize him? And everybody got mad because they're so used to using us like pinatas once they get mad at us and they can bang at us. The whole world takes their aggression out on us. Even language, language is so powerful. The term black on black crime pisses me off because white people kill each other at the exact same rate that we kill ourselves, right? It's proximity. Asian people, all people kill their own the most. But when it comes to us, they try to make us think that we are pathologically more violent by creating a term only for us when everybody's doing the same thing. And so we have to be really, really mindful about the way that we talk about each other, not just in front of company, but to ourselves. All human beings walk through the earth asking the same three questions. Do you hear me? Do you see me? Do I matter? And I feel like whenever the answer is yes to all three, that's love, right? And so whenever you're talking to another black person, do you hear them? Do you see them? Do they matter? You don't have to agree for any of that to happen. And I think a lot of us have gotten so righteously indignant that we've stopped showing dignity to each other. And if that alone changed, the temperature would change with the way that the media, mainstream media, even though we're the mainstream media, sees us. So I'm just going to ask that, treat black people like they're human, and that's going to be a black future right there. I, I, it, it actually... I felt something when we were clapping for you because that's literally what we're here to do is give each other our flowers. We're here to give each other credit um, and we're here to look into that future together. Um, so one question I want to throw out to the room is as we're looking into our black future, we're obviously sitting here in a physical embodied form, but like what does your future look like in a world that is Web3, that is digital, that is even more connected than ever in some ways? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Demisha. I work for Vibe Magazine. Um, for me, as far as a media and a journalism standpoint, um, going into the future with things like the metaverse and with the digital and how things are pretty much everything is online. People build entire lives online. You'll never know them from behind a computer screen or behind a phone. Um, I think entering that space through media and through journalism is a space for us to be able to go forward and make more honest content, make more authentic content, and make more content that's true to ourselves and really be able to kind of gatekeep other cultures and other communities out from taking what's ours and really sealing the deal and putting our name on what we create. And I think going forward digitally, we'll have more opportunities to be able to have these closed spaces to where our culture is not being hijacked, our culture is not being appropriated by somebody else using it to get on because we'll be able to put each other on and hold those spaces for us and our audiences and our talent and our people. So um, that's something that I think that the metaverse and the digital space can bring for media is us being able to close those doors and lock those gates and having our culture presented to us, for us, and by us. You know what I love about this, uh, about this is we have the right to disagree on things. Like, I don't know a lot about the metaverse, but it's okay for her to have that opinion, okay for me to have an opinion. I'm into physical goods, and it's okay. We gotta turn it to the barber shop. He, it's, Jesse, I said it, mama call him Cassius, I'ma call him Cassius, whatever that is, because we're not even allowed to have that discourse. And this is how we have to check each other and support each other to never speak down about ourselves and you know, pub, this is like a semi-public setting, but we have to like cross some of these red lines a bit to make something different. Did, did, does anybody see somebody who might have been fearless three weeks ago, sitting right next to me, that they tried to pay to go to an insane asylum so they could run that narrative and put that scarlet letter that I wear on him for the rest of his life? You know, it's, it comes to a point where uh... We get antagonized of uh, fake narratives, and it's like we playing a game that uh, that's unfair, you know, it's unjust. And uh, luckily, I'm in a position 
where I can be able to walk off, but a lot of people are in positions where they can't. So financially, physically, emotionally, you know, uh, it's been just unfair for us, unjust. We're not trying to be advocates, but we're trying to promote Black Future Month. We're giving people who may not be like Ye, who may not be a good football player like me, opportunities. Because when, when their sport's over, when, when their game's over, you know, life still goes on. Football is just what I do. It's not who I am. So sometimes we are defined by what we do, and it's a bigger picture. He got a bigger cause. He's not just, you know what I mean, letting people hand on writing narratives and even position to help the future, empower the youth, you know, find the next superhero. So it's not about showing kids that you can run off the field. It's about, you know, not letting people treat you unjust based on the position we in. You know, I have rights as a football player to play healthy. If I can't play, I can't play. You can't force me. You know, that's when people see us, they feel like we're a carnival. They could just come to us, put a camera on us. But we're here today to represent uh, Thunder Sports and give people the opportunity, give people a, a, a impact the future, empower them as leaders. So don't take the moment of me walking off the field for granted. It's not to exemplify quitting or giving up. It's to exemplify human rights and be able to know as people, the black dollar is important. And coming together here today, we could do so much inspiring things. Thank you. Um, we only have, because I really want everybody to experience Sunday service, and there were two people that still want to talk, James and then Emerald, and then if we can, we're all going to move over here and mingle and talk while they set up for Sunday service, and then I promise you it's going to be the most amazing thing you've experienced. So James DeBose from Fox Soul. Uh, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. I'm James from Fox Soul. I just wanted to go back to um, what Jason has talked about ownership, because first of all, being the head of Fox Soul, I I have to deal with the elephant in the room. It's like Fox is doing a black network that's unapologetically for black people. Um, and one of the things that was very important to me in the beginning is I was not going to be the black face while people that are not of the culture are pulling the strings behind the culture. That wasn't going to happen. And I'm, I'm not going to talk long, but one of the most important things was I wanted to bring as many black people to Fox as I could. So what I went out and strategically did, I partnered with Hollywood Unlocked. And when we do partnerships... We allow the people to keep their own IP, to own their IP, to, to remain ownerships of, of their creativity. I partnered with Black Enterprise, with Dame Dash Studios, uh, with For Us, By Us. So it's not about Fox Soul. I want to say if you want to continue moving us forward, if you will, sometimes you got to take bullets that no one even see you having to take for the betterment of the culture. Um, so just continue to know your worth. They'll call it um, negotiations, but they're trying to lower your value. Jason is one thing, and I just really want to give him his flowers, that when he came in and he and I was going back and forth on the money, he was not budging no, off no, of his no, value. No, 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 <laughs> we were talking, yeah, yeah, we were, we were, we were arguing about the money. Yeah. He, he was not budging. We didn't argue, we, we got, James and I communicate in a very friendly way, a very respectful way, but it's, I mean, you respect me as a business person, you know, you don't see me as a tea spiller or a gossiper or a blogger or whatever, like, you, you respect me as a businessman, I think that, that's important to me, and that's why the relationship works. But we, we, don't, we don't fight over money. We just um, we talk about how yeah, to get more and, money. And the last thing I want to say is a lot of I think of time, fighting is good. I just want to point that out. We have to fight yeah. with each other. I'm just going to say it real quick. Not going to be a long piece. I wanted to call this the Black Future Month Brunch. He wanted to call it the Black Brunch. He said, I think the whole spirit is lost on this. I had other stuff involved with it. And we going back and forth on text. I said his idea is whack, and he said my idea was not the right idea, but it was good that we went back and forth, that he ain't no yes man, and I'm not no yes man, and we can't be yes in each other. If we don't agree with something, we can come to a place where we synthesize and find a blue water that we can agree upon, but we have to be willing to argue. So I know we say that. I'm not saying arguing like in a negative way. I'm thinking that's a positive way, so I wanted to just say that. But in doing that, it did turn out better, and it was his idea, so... Sorry, James. Go ahead, James. No, that's right. And the last thing, I think, just in terms of content, some of what we're talking about, I know what, 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 what I said, Fox Soul, I'm trying to celebrate our rhythms and our blues, our ups and our downs. Um, they'll come to you, especially black people, is they want to talk about your success. Take someone like AB, the success he's had on the football field. But I'm more interested now in when that moment came where you had to make a decision when you was at your lowest point, and we all have been there, unless we're lying to each other. I know I've been there and, and not giving up on each other when we get to that point. 
because that's where the gift is. That's where we learn from other people, and that's where our gift lies is in the down and not necessarily up. And I try to tell people now, the success didn't bring you the gift. It's your gift that brought you the success. So as long as you can still do what you do, you're going to be successful again no matter how low you go. And those are the type of stories that we need to tell among us because they'll never tell that story for us. I agree. How you guys doing? My name is Emerald Marie. Jason, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I just wanted to comment on just the amazing things that were said today. So earlier we spoke a lot about um, the responsibility that we have in this media space. But I also wanted to speak about accountability. And so um, Jason you know, alluded to what happened on the red carpet with Holly Berry and I. And we were on the red carpet. And you know, as those who are on the red carpet, we kind of have joked before about the back of the bus being, you know, on the, on the back end of the carpet and Holly Berry had walked by and, um, I was just calling her name and kept saying my question out loud. And she turned around and said, why am I skipping her brother and a sister? And then she came back and we did the interview. And, you know, that, that was a pivotal moment in my career because she reached back for me. Um, and when we end up having a conversation later, I wanted to, um, share some things that Holly had said to me. I, you know, she said, I had no idea this was a problem. I had no idea that black outlets weren't getting a respected time. And I said, Holly, if you look at your team, not one person in your team looks like you. And I was like, they don't care about us. They don't care about our voice. They don't care about you. Her PR person kept pushing, you know, past and they didn't care to stop to people who look like you. You would never have JLo on a red carpet skip a Spanish speaking outlet. That sounds crazy. So why, why is it happening with us? And so she said to me, and I was fresh out of school, I was afraid to even post that video. Um, and she said to me, you know, I just commend you and your boldness for even saying that to me because you're, you're right. And for that to, for me to be fresh out of school and just timid at that time, I had reached out to so many of my black counterparts and reporters. And I said, I have this video, my videographer captured it of Holly saying, you know, why are you being skipped? And I said, I don't know if I should post it. I really want to, I'm a freelancer. I want a job in this. I don't want to ruffle feathers. And all the reporters I reached out said, you know, we're lucky to be in this space. Don't do it. Don't post it. And I had seen the Breakfast Club interview with Jason Lee speaking up on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, this isn't just me. Like, this is, this is, this is real. It's not in my head because everyone else is telling me not to say it. And my grandmother, who, you know, was a Black Panther and just my family of leaders, um, said to me, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so I just thank Jason and, and Ye for being that squeaky wheel. And, you know, thank you. Well, and, you know, I don't think I'm doing anything special because <clears throat> the fact that I own my stuff and can't be fired is the reason why I have so much courage, right? Uh, they, they say to me, well, you know, if you say that... You're not going to get this. Well, that, then, then God didn't make that for me. And stop telling me that if I do this and represent transparency, that I'm not going to have the privilege of falling in line because I don't want to fall in line. I want to get up and do what is on my mind and on my heart. And people will at some point come to terms with accepting that, that I have the right to have the same space and the same opinion. When I saw what happened to you, I think about Keisha, who's my East Coast editor for Hollywood Unlocked. And when I think about my staff, and how hard they f get up, get ready, get, you know, women to take y'all a little longer, get on trains, get in cars, get there, get on the carpet to be shoved to the end and given one microphone to ask a question. Maybe it's disrespectful when we talk about you every day and the Hollywood reporter may talk about you once a quarter. And so I just, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that while we brought like the most amazing executives together, YouTubers, but also like Gail Mitchell, I want to give her her flowers from Billboard, who's been holding us down over there for years. You know, today was less about me and thank you for the flowers or less about yay, but all about us coming together as one and having uh, hopefully one of many conversations because I really feel it was uh, a really, really well time spent. Connie, real quick, and then we're going to close if that's okay for Sunday service. Connie, is there a microphone over there for Connie? I just, I mean, I think this is great, right? So how do we keep it going? Like, what's the next one? How do we keep gathering and coming together and getting steps that empower us and move us forward? So while, that, he said he'll do every week. Look, this is what we should do. This was, this, this, wait, wait, I love Connie for the homework, right? I think, honestly, Connie, we should all come over here as a group and talk. Let's huddle. Let's come up with some ideas. You know, we tend to hold our relationships close to our chest because we don't want nobody to eat more than us. But there's enough food on this table for everybody. I don't lose nothing by bringing everybody for me to end with, yeah? You know what I mean? So...
This y'all being right here is putting money back into our community, but also putting esteem back into our own community. For us to hear your story, the next person on the carpet gonna stand up. The next person, it's like what Spike Lee was trying to ignite at the end of Malcolm X and everybody got up on the table and said, I am Malcolm X, I am Malcolm X. And people sometimes they just say, I'm not gonna do a yay, or I'm not gonna, they would like say it right before they about to say something. But with us, we could say everything. We can control our narrative in Black Future Month. This is the future. Let the church say amen. <laughs>